Professor Gary Lilienthal. I have qualifications in both psychoanalysis and in the law. My master's degree was in Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis with a high distinction average. <clears throat> My PhD doctoral research applied psychoanalytic methodology to the tracing of some 1,000 years of legal history of the intellectual property torts. I have been involved in research in one way or another all my adult life. One day, I sat in a massive university auditorium in a wonderful Southeast Asian university of very large proportions, listening to the Vice-Chancellor deliver a major oration to the entire cohort of several thousand academics. In his oration, the Vice-Chancellor remarked that the university must do a better job of exploiting its human capital. I was so intrigued by this injunction. What did he mean by human capital? I didn't know. Do you? As my academic field is law, I turned to my colleagues in the fields of economics, the social sciences and anthropology, and mercifully they guided me. The outcome is the remarkable compendium of research in the field of economic law on the topic of human capital that is the subject of this audiovisual presentation. As you absorb the research and its syntheses, I hope you gain much understanding and achieve many new insights. This bust of Lei Feng in a park in the Hunan Normal University campus in Changsha, China, memorializes his iconic character. He was a People's Liberation Army soldier who died at 21 years of age and represented the personification of altruism. The inscription on the body of the bust translates into English to learn from Comrade Lei Feng. This inscription is in the personal handwriting of Mao Zedong, but does not expressly teach us what to learn. However, we do know that a bust of a person is a kind of external storage of a symbol, a head representing the essence of the person so symbolized but dismembered from its body. This one is Sir Donald Bradman. Here in Cricket Captain's Walk, there are many busts of past cricket captains, heads dismembered from their bodies. As such, we are reminded of the famous oath of homage by which feudalism was instituted in the United Kingdom. Here's the oath. Sir Edward Cope described homage as follows. Homage is the most honourable service and most humble service of reverence that a frank tenant may do to his lord. For when the tenant shall make homage to his lord, he shall be ungirt and his head uncovered, and his lord shall sit and the tenant shall kneel before him on both his knees and hold his hands jointly together between the hands of his lord and shall say thus, I become your man from this day forward of life and limb and of earthly worship and unto you shall be true and faithful and bear to you faith for the tenements that I claim to hold of you, saving the faith that I owe unto our sovereign Lord the King and then the Lord so sitting shall kiss him. Thus we can see that in both the, both the case of Lei Feng and also of the cricket captains, this was a representation of a transfer of human capital, the one selflessly to the state and the other passing his very self to a private lord. But what is human capital? I now invite you to suspend your disbelief as we travel through this remarkable research, 
trying to answer all these questions. Human capital theory is within the domain of economic law. In Western countries, economic law is broadly non-justiciable. Thus, if you are subject to the law of supply and demand, for example, uh, to your detriment, no court will afford you an adequate remedy. See my publication on juridical personality in the journal Jurisprudence to see how ability to sue in court is routinely removed by epideictic rhetoric. We begin with the introduction to the research. A recent Harvard study reports that American senior managers and financial investors now demand greater clarity about how a business organization's people create value for the stakeholders. As it appears, these business metrics are not being reported publicly. These people have now expressed a greater desire to link human capital performance with business outcomes. Now, while researching the history of managerial practices, Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal, when she was a Harvard Newcomen Fellow in Business History at Harvard Business School, found it to be significant that many of the management techniques developed by 1800s United States slave owners still were being used extensively in today's business management. Dr. Rosenthal found that many plantations had used an accounting system explained in Affleck's Plantation, Record and Account Books. These books contained instructions on how to calculate depreciation of plantation slaves in order to determine the plantation's actual capital costs. Therefore, this researcher's general objective is to investigate critically the possibility of any relationship between human capital and slavery. Chen defined human capital as the present value of a person's future income from his own labour, without his actually identifying the ownership of this capital. Nevertheless, it's clear that modern management accounting deals with how businesses can model human beings as corporate capital assets. This sounds like an attempt to transfer a person's human capital into someone else's hands, as if it were a property transaction. The term slavery means, as defined in the Slavery Convention of 1926, the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. And the term slave means a person in such condition or status. Suggesting a concern for business managers in the extent of their dealings with employees. However, domestication is where humans transform wild animals and plants into more useful products by controlling their breeding. The scholarship also suggests the existence of human domestication, academic analyses of which are apparently, these days, carefully avoided, which raises the possibility of some kind of continuum of scale for slavery. From this, the question arises as to whether the body of scholarship on the term human capital constitutes a species of the meaning of the term slavery, and if so, in what way? I try to show that the term human capital suggests an apparently non-violent form of slavery characterised as arrangements for human domestication through education. In the result, a human capital institution is now fully operational since the 1960s. It acts to differentiate the capital values of people through their different kinds of usefulness to the master class of society, measured through their education. This is not an individual relationship of master and slave. It is an enslaving state offering apparently free choice to a mass slave class. Therefore, the international law becomes relevant. 
to see if the state had crossed the line of exercising powers of property in human beings. This exercise in meta-legal critical analysis tries to unveil the norms underlying the concept of human capital from the extant scholarship, from economic laws, natural law and some relevant international law. As such, it is similar in structure to an exercise of deliberation in the field of economic law. The researcher's methodology is by library research, specifically because both slavery and human capital are primarily theoretical generic constructs manifesting within many species. The research is a cross-disciplinary synthesis of economics, anthropology, natural law and international law. To this extent, this synthesis therefore mirrors constituent components of economic law as it operates in business. The term human capital is principally considered to be a term sequestered within the field of economics. Thus, the research must first critically examine this term from within the field of economics. This will require anthropological inputs as well. Considering that significant ideas continue to inhere over long periods of time, the researcher's argument looks at all aspects of a suggested continuum of slavery. It is based on a legal narrative analysis of the development of ideas of slavery, with human domestication at the more benign lower limit and brutal forced enslavement at the more publicly malignant end of the suggested continuum. The researcher's argument is structured to begin with a major section on property in human beings, followed by another major section on the character of slavery. With these essential pieces of groundwork laid, argument moves on to an investigation into the scholarship of human capital theory and its foundations as a merely apparent new field of scholarly inquiry. This leads to a critical investigation of the organisational consequences of this new field as a professional construct and as what the scholarship calls a human capital revolution. Following these links in the chain of argument, the research will present a short critical briefing into the development of international law definitions of slavery, so to assess it against what the reader will have learned about the scholarship of slavery and human capital. The research outcomes will strongly suggest that human capital is an imposed process of human differentiation by the masters onto the servants, which must inevitably affect that differentiation bearing on human breeding. The creation of human capital can be seen as an indicium of apparently voluntary slavery by means of mass inducement into human domestication by sedentism, external storage of symbols and loss of juridical personality. Human capital appears to have been made unavailable for recognised deliberation by classes of servants, as Schultz had seized control masterfully of its very idea when he created a recognised institutional monopoly, monopoly of thinking in the field. Human capital must thus be an idea for use of the social class of masters, arguably the states. The international law proscribes the exercising of a power of property over human beings, masterfully manipulating the breeding of large groups of human beings, constraining them into sedentism and regulating their usefulness by mass control of knowledge, implies the exercise of a right to manage and a right of capital in people. This is exercising powers of property over human beings. It suggests a violation of the Rome Statute definition of enslavement. Now, 
we have had a chance to consider general points to introduce this field of human capital research. The first element of human capital that we need to understand is the issue of property in human beings. I know that many people think that property in human beings is a thing of the past, something completely abolished, but it just isn't true. This kind of property is exercised in ways not always obvious to the observer. You will see it is exercised on a continuum between the artifice of human domestication at one limit and brutal force at the other limit. Let's now consider all this in depth. Property in human beings. Let's first discuss domestication. Slavery was the domestication of human beings by a master's urge to control, which was just as strong as in the subjection of wild beasts. It constituted a worldview by a large class of masters to organize labor and divide it by domestication. Divisions of labour, therefore, suggesting a built environment, encouraging sedentism. The built environment encouraged sedentism. Domestication of human beings. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Because cultural or behavioural determinants are most powerful in today's life choices, there must have been a time when they began to outweigh Darwinian selection. This infers an apparent reduction in evolutionary fitness of Homo sapiens, which in Bednarik's argument seems to have been marked by the time when physical appearance became a primary cultural construct affecting human choices of their mates. This behavioural process, namely domestication, began with a male sexual preference for those females having a more youthful physical appearance. Thus, the human females led the process. Cultural factors now dominated in human breeding and human breeding patterns, evidenced by external symbol storage, so that modern humans are now the result of their own domestication and are utterly dependent on those who command and control their externally stored symbols. Developing state property in human beings. This is a very interesting extension from the theory we've just discussed. Now, according to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, soon to be enacted, despite the fact that nobody in the population has read it, suggesting entrenched status and administrative limitations, persons with a recognised interest under parties laws must have appropriate access to impartial and independent tribunals for enforcing the state party's labour laws. There must be rights to seek review of appeal as appropriate under the party's law suggesting that forms of review will fit with current national review systems as they have developed over time. However, the bias towards administrative redress rather than litigation suggests a move away from litigating labour rights, inferring their progressive loss. 
through an effective loss of workers' juridical personality, meaning they can't sue in court. Free and informed consent in the surrogacy factories. Division of labour encourages sedentism, such as in surrogacy factories. External control of people's externally stored symbols and a loss of juridical personality by a specious form of voluntary consent, such as, for example, the consent to have somebody else's child. This could point to the formation of a mass slave class. Sedentism suggested a failure to mobilise and unite various forms of labour. Destruction of the unions being an example. People's symbols being stored externally and controlled by others, such as, for example, on the internet, suggested a de-skilling of the work environment by transferring their symbols to the control of others. Loss of juridical personality suggested a lack of judicial relief from oppressive work environments inferring an exercise of power of property over human beings. All of these taken together suggested the existence of a controlling class, a very large class, spread geographically, whose capital was the sedentism, symbols and juridical personality of other people. Property in human beings is the threshold precondition to slavery. So let's now look at the nature of slavery. We will do this with a very exhaustive, critical literature review of the scholars' concepts of slavery. The scholarship of slavery. Let's first begin by discussing the anthropology of slavery. There were scholarly disagreements with many aspects of Niebuhr's research. Niebuhr you need to look at. Noting the absence of the supply side factor that demand for slavery did not always provide slaves. Sumner and Keller foresaw the view of many modern critics that slavery required an infrastructure for controlling the slaves and it thus comes to be an issue of the regulative or political organisation quite as much as the economic. Can't have slavery without government regulation. This inferred a master class acting specifically to truncate people's juridical personalities in order to secure a steady and constant industry. In this way, the products of this steady industry could be characterised as property by the master class. Nevertheless, situating slavery in the field infers operation of natural law. So, natural law and slavery need to be looked at. Natural law and slavery. Differing with Grotius and Pufendorf, John Locke reasoned that this property could not be sold or given away. He said, a man not having the power over his own life cannot by compact or his own consent enslave himself to anyone, nor put himself under the absolute arbitrary power of another to take away his life whenever he pleases. Nobody can give more power than he has himself. And he that cannot take away his own life cannot give another power over it. However, if a man by his own fault forfeited his own life by some act that deserves death, he to whom he has forfeited it may, when he has him in his power, delay to take it and make use of him to his own service and he does him no injury by it. That's what Locke said. Locke designated this state as the perfect condition of slavery, which is nothing else but the state of war continued between a lawful conqueror and a captive, and including the master's characteristic defence of the slave's voluntary consent. 
He articulated strongly that as soon as an agreement takes place between a captive and his conqueror, limiting the conqueror's powers by agreement, the state of war ceases and therefore so does the state of slavery. The new relationship, which is the outcome of this compact, is one of master and servant and no longer of conqueror and slave. A rightless state of slavery is only possible, therefore, when the slave moves outside the social contract by, for instance, instigating unjust warfare. The slave can always re-execute the social contract later, if he wants, by agreement with the conqueror, thereby acquiring the rights of a servant or domesticated labourer. Such sudden removal of brutality suggests an alternate form of slavery, dependent more on domestication. The state of natural law thus suggests the barbaric warrior falsely perceived contractual consent by the slave, even although this consent was unlikely to have ever held true. Our deliberations have now given us a very good idea of the nature of slavery arising as it does from claims of property in human beings and the forceful exercise of those claims. Now we turn to the scholarship in the field of economics. This will help us establish the character of the economic law. Human capital theory, foundations of a field of inquiry. Schultz repeated the need again and again to discuss the pure consumption portion of costs. Becker digressed from the total returns approach to investigate rates of return from human capital investments in education and training. Sweetland summarised the fundamental basis of this investigation as follows. He said, probably the most impressive piece of evidence is that more highly educated and skilled persons almost always tend to earn more than others. This is true of developed countries, as different as the United States and the old Soviet Union, of underdeveloped countries, as different as India and Cuba, and of the United States 100 years ago, as well as today. Moreover, few if any countries have achieved a sustained period of economic development without having invested substantial amounts in their labour force and most studies that have attempted quantitative assessments of contributions to growth have assigned an important role to investment in human capital. Thus, the more worker sedentism, the more worker income necessarily derived from the controlling class of masters. Becker then proposed a methodology for using the inputs of costs of education and economic returns on education investment to derive an internal rate of return on costs. He used 1950 census data and this methodology produced a 13% best single estimate of the private rate of return on investments in education, 13%. Becker reviewed literature correlating education and native ability, maintaining that the rate of return always would be more than 10% after statistically compensating for native ability. He also commented thus, economists and others have generally had little success in estimating the social effects of different investments and unfortunately education is no exception. One can however develop some lower and upper limits that effectively rule out many of the more fanciful assertions about the effects of education. Becker's calculations inferred a 12.5% minimum and a 25% maximum, 
all this groundwork readied it to become an institution. It's clear to us now that human capital is a mass assumption of property in human beings by a class of people who gain financially from this assumption. But more, in the 1960s, there was a movement to actually institutionalize human capital. This was just as significant as, many centuries ago, the institutionalization of marriage. This institutionalization took marriage out of people's hands and put it into church control and later into state statutes. Now, human capital became an institution, even having its own scholarly journal. Let's look into this development. The human capital revolution. Nowadays, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, primarily uses three broadly stated levels of education coming from its international standard classification of education, its ISCED of 1997, to classify students around the world, of course, without their knowledge. It, distingu it distinguishes only between one, lower than upper secondary, two, the higher secondary and after secondary non-tertiary, and three, the tertiary levels of education. Academic research now tends to follow this approach. Sometimes the investigation is even delimited to the distinguishing between one, lower than upper secondary, and three, a tertiary level of education. However, it appears from prior research that these education measures may be invalid attainment measures within country jurisdictions. The consequence is they may not be comparable between countries, but are nevertheless still used as international controls on human capital. It appears that in this way, education controls people's externally stored symbols. With these administrative arrangements, a human capital institution is now fully operational. It acts to differentiate the capital values of people through their different kinds of usefulness to the masterclass of society and international society. This was not an individual relationship of master and slave. It's an enslaving state offering apparent free choice to a mass slave class. Therefore, the international law becomes relevant to see if the state had crossed the boundary of property in human beings. With the entire field of human capital now fully institutionalized, it remains to be seen what the international law of slavery comprised. So, in the next deliberation, we compare human capital theory and slavery using the definitions of slavery in international law. The international law definitions of slavery Article 7.2c of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court articulates enslavement as a crime against humanity and it's within the court's jurisdiction. In the 2001 Cunarek case, the trial chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia determined that the actus reus of the violation of enslavement is the exercise of any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person. The mens rea of the violation consists in the intentional exercise of these powers. In 2007, Alain deduced 
that any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person were circumscribed by the following, and I quote from Alain, the right to possess, the right to use, the right to manage, the right to the income of the thing, the right or incidence of transmissibility, the right or incidence of absence of the term, the prohibition of harmful use, liability to execution, and the right to the capital, incident of residuarity, and finally, the right to security. Notably, a right to manage, together with a right to the capital in the person taken together, therefore do constitute any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person, and therefore comprise the actus reus of enslavement under Article 7.2c of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Intention can always be inferred on the basis of the old legal maxim that a man is taken to have intended the natural consequences of his actions, with the debate being over what are natural consequences. Our master class of barbaric warriors certainly espouses a right to manage and a right to capital in the effectively sedentary subjects of their administration. The truncated juridical personalities suggests they approach a state of rightlessness. Okay, we are almost done. We have absorbed so much about human capital theory. Now, I'll put it all together in our final conclusion. The nice thing about this conclusion to this research is that because of the broad scope and the depth of the research, you can make many of your own linkages. So, although slavery's beginnings were in the economic use of prisoners of war, Maine preferred it to be characterized by a legal rather than a status theory which he said were still unabsorbed into modern analyses, possibly because legal systems claim a right to articulate societal symbols. Slavery could be divided into the early domestic kind and a later chattel kind, with labour as only one of the many uses for slaves. This suggested that slavery could be characterised as being on a continuum, whose limits were inducement into domestication through sedentism, control of externally stored symbols and workers' loss of juridical personality, and at the other end of the continuum, physically seizing the human being by force. Slavery, in any case, is the mere act of seizing people, equally as significant or insignificant to some as appropriating fire or animals. Thus, the act of seizing infers the institution of property, meaning the slave is considered as now having an enhanced use, or in other words, being useful. When the barbaric warrior spares his enemy's life, he brings him home to do his work, to be more useful than as a languishing prisoner, but now as his slave. This could explain why Marx saw the ancient slave as an organic accessory of the land and a further development of property arising in the family. Marx did not see slavery as sources in war. He saw slavery as a latent facet of family life, no doubt measured by a person's practical usefulness within the necessarily sedentary institution of the family. Slavery would manifest spontaneously only with population increase and with the needs inherent in external war or trade. Niebuhr defined the slave simply as a man who was another's property, deftly circumscribed by subjection to management and international assessment as to level of capital. Niebuhr's slave had a lower political and social status and was compelled to labour, 
slavery arose entirely out of an inverse relationship with the level of state appropriation of land. This was because when all the land was appropriated, some independent labour became willing to hire itself out for wages. Since free labour could be used more flexibly and efficiently than slave labour, the entrepreneur preferred wage labour and Niebuhr's version of slavery would wither away. However, it can now be seen that slavery required a regulative and political infrastructure for controlling the slaves, suggesting the state might not want it to wither away. The OECD appears to regulate human capital indicia on behalf of member states. To sustain this view, Grotius had said that although slavery was contrary to nature, it did not conflict with natural justice that slavery should arise from a mere convention or a substantive crime. The crime of kidnapping comes to mind. According to Grotius, legal slavery had its two sources in self-sale for gaining the means of self-preservation and capture during a just war. The idea of a just war must relate to the ambient level of state appropriation of land, inasmuch as states can seize land during the conquests of war. Following this reasoning, Pufendorf proposed a qualified state of nature, agreeing with Maine, where the institutions of marriage, private property and slavery each arose because of agreements. As institution, each was therefore subject to externally stored symbols. Locke reasoned that property in a human being was incapable of being sold or given away. He did not say it could not be seized. He designated this seizing as the perfect condition of slavery, which was the continued state of war. When the captive and the conqueror agreed to limit the conqueror's powers, the state of war ended, and with it the state of slavery. The two became master and servant, and were no longer conqueror and slave. Locke reasoned that a rightless state of slavery was only possible if the slave breached the social contract by instigating an unjust war. He did not particularise this unjustness. Nevertheless, when the slave re-executed the social contract with the conqueror, he acquired the rights of a servant. Locke's sophistry had apparently elevated the barbaric conqueror to the status of a just warrior, imagining the contractual consent of the conquered. Seizing human beings, justly or unjustly, must have a better explanation. Domestication meant that process where humans transfor transformed wild animals and plants into more useful products by somehow controlling their breeding. Jacobi characterised slavery as the domestication of human beings by a master's urge to control, which was just as strong as in the subjection of wild beasts. This now resonates with the idea of the barbaric conqueror, discussed as above meaning that human domestication must amount to some kind of control, at least symbolic or social, over human breeding. The surrogacy farms illustrated this colourfully, with the female surrogates never in a state of full acquiescence in their contractual consent to be so used. Smith's two principal elements of human capital were, first, the acquired and useful abilities, of all the inhabitants or members of the society, in addition to the state of the skill, dexterity and judgment with which labour is applied. Second was ability acquired through education, study or apprenticeship as a capital fixed and realised in the person. Thus human capital sounds like an imposed process of human differentiation by the master onto the servant, inevitably affecting human breeding. Marshall described human capital as all stored up provision for the production of material goods. 
This implied a kind of prior seizing of people. Fisher stated that wealth in its broadest sense included human beings because human beings were human machines. Mintz's statement of rationale was that human capital resulted from an investment subject to free choice, referring to training differing primarily in the length of time it required. Together, this suggested an illusion of free choice for people to undertake a long process of change through education, resulting in enhanced material production. It is difficult, therefore, not to regard human capital generation as the prelude to apparently voluntary inducement into slavery by human domestication, people already having been seized into long periods of education. Schultz's 1960 address to the American Economic Association, as its president, began by agreeing with Mintz's rationale. Schultz listed the following five major categories of human activity investments, which he said steered towards improved human capabilities, or in other words, human usefulness. They were health facilities and services to increase life expectancy, on-the-job training, formally organized education, study programs for adults, and migration of individuals and families for changing job opportunities. All except the last were direct outcomes of political and state infrastructure. Schultz also asserted that knowledge was a contributor to human capital. However, he preferred to associate knowledge with schooling and the research functioning of the educational establishment. This is an inference without evidence. This linked international controls, such as that of the OECD, with enforced sedentism. Sweetland noted the most impressive piece of evidence for this proposition was that more highly educated and skilled persons almost always tended to earn more than others, the income always coming from the master class in charge of articulating externally stored symbols. Few countries had achieved any sustained economic development without investing substantially in their labour force. This was mass investment by the state in human capital, or creation of methodologies for capitalising human usefulness. The human capital literature received its initial major impetus through a collection of influential papers in the 1962 special issue of the Journal of Political Economy entitled Investment in Human Beings, edited by Schultz. This masterwork published together nearly all the major arguments and directions human capital theory took over the ensuing decades arguably still persisting to this day. Thus, Schultz seized control of the very idea of human capital by creating a monopoly of scholarly thinking and deliberation in the field. Many scholars disagreed with the term human capital as it equated humans with slaves or machines. However, they were essentially ignored. Becker's book Human Capital provided far-reaching analytical bases for comprehending investments in human capital, no doubt piquing the interest of business. The personal distribution of educational accomplishments and earnings was explained by the parallel development of Mintz's human capital earnings function, as summarised in his schooling experience and earnings. Human capital as an imposed process of human differentiation by the master onto the servant must inevitably affect human breeding as prospective partners see people as being either more useful or less so. The creation of human capital can be seen as an indicium of voluntary slavery by human domestication. The very idea of human capital appears to be unavailable for recognised deliberation by servants, as Schultz had seized control of its very idea when he created a monopoly of thinking in the field. 
Human capital must be an idea for use by the social class of masters, including business employers, together arguably comprising the state. The international law proscribes the state exercising a power of property over human beings, masterfully manipulating the breeding of large groups of human beings, is exercising a power of property over human beings because it argues for their enhanced usefulness, even although they appear to consent freely to contract into this mass arrangement. Although Affleck's plantation record and account books have now disappeared from use, businesses have recognised the veiled nature of capitalising human beings and instead of proscribing it, now want it reported publicly. That concludes our research, but we must consider that the busts of Lei Fang and the busts of the cricket captains had one thing in common. Both of them were decapitated and both of them had contributed their human capital to the state. Music